Hello, everyone, and welcome again. My name is Kobe Rizik, and I serve as the Student Membership Director of the Buckley Program. This evening, I have the honor of introducing Mr. Mike Frank, uh, who will be moderating the debate that we're about to have on American trade policy. Uh, Mike Frank is both a research fellow and the current director of DC programs for the Hoover Institution, a public policy think tank headquarters on the campus of Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. For 20 years, Mike also served as Vice President for Government Studies at the Heritage Foundation and has been widely published in online and print publications, including the National Review. Mr. Frank is a longtime veteran of DC policymaking, having previously served as Policy Director and Counsel for House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy, as well as Communications Director for, excuse me, former House Majority Leader Dick Armey. A native of New York City, he received his undergraduate degree from Yale College and his law degree from Georgetown University. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Mike Frank. Okay, it's great to be here. I'm glad so many students are here especially, not to disparage any of the ad other adults in the room, but great to see the students. And that there's 320, I believe, uh, Buckley Fellows now. Uh, among the undergraduates at Yale, so that's terrific news. So today's debate, featuring two very prominent and well-versed uh, experts on the topic, uh, will be on the question of resolve that the United States should adopt a policy to reduce trade deficits. I'll introduce the speakers first. They will each uh, make their case for seven minutes, and then each will get three minutes for a rebuttal, at which point we'll turn to questions. Okay, so we could do five minutes if you need. Oren Cass is senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and he's focused on uh, policy uh, discussions relating to strengthening the labor market, uh, relating to the social safety net, environmental regulation, trade, immigration, education, and organized labor. Uh, he's written a book recently called The Once and Future Worker. It's just about to reach its uh, one-year mark since its publication date. Uh, I have not read it, but after reading some of the reviews, I quickly ordered it, so I would encourage you to do the same. Um, it's been called The Essential Policy Book of Our Time. That's pretty impressive. And an unflinching indictment of the mistakes that Washington has made for a generation and continues to make today. Prior to be joining the Manhattan Institute, Oren uh, was domestic policy director for Mitt Romney's presidential campaign in 2012. He was an editor of the Harvard Law Review and a management consultant at Bain & Company. Uh, he has a BA in political economy from Williams, and as, I, as you probably could tell, his JD is from Harvard. Our second presenter, Veronique de Rougier, uh, is senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center in Washington, uh, D.C. She has um, a long track record as a distinguished economist, French trained. She has been writing prolifically on an issue that has nagged a lot of us in Washington policy circles for a long time, the getting rid of the Export-Import Bank. And she's probably the leading voice in that field. She's a, a libertarian-styled economist. She's uh, versed in all the issues and has done a crash course on all the different arguments, it probably didn't take much time, on uh, for or against trade deficits. So she'll be present uh, on the second slide. So Oren, why don't you start, seven minutes, and I'm gonna get a high sign from one of our students in the second row when we get to the six minute mark. Good. All right, well thank you guys very much for being here, especially 5.30 on a Friday, we're gonna bring the weekend excitement to the, to the conference, I guess. Um, I have my Yale tie on, which should be sufficient to win the debate, but if not, <laughs> I'm going to start with a quote from Frederick Hayek, uh, not from The Road to Serfdom, but from a later essay and, and speech called Why I Am Not a Conservative, in which he said, especially in the economic field, the self-regulating forces of the market will somehow bring about the required adjustments to new conditions. And it's this, quote, faith in the spontaneous forces of adjustment which make the liberal, he means the classical liberal, accept changes without apprehension, even though he does not know how the necessary adaptations will be brought about. Now, I think that's an admirable sentiment, uh, but we know that it's not true. 
We know that markets do not somehow adapt automatically to all conditions. We know this because there are huge categories of things like public goods where no one would argue that markets automatically will take them into account. We have government provision of all sorts of things. We don't expect the market to take changing national security conditions into account. We don't expect the market to take need for infrastructure investment into account. Uh, we have patents and a wide range of intellectual property provisions because we don't expect the market fully to take account of investment in innovation. We also have regulations for things like pollution because we don't expect the market fully to account for things like pollution. Uh, and we have things like public education because we don't expect the market fully to take into account concerns of fairness and justice that we all have. So the question isn't whether we can simply trust the self-regulating forces in all cases. We know that we can't. The question is where can and where can't we? And my argument would be uh, that the trade deficit is something that we cannot trust the market to self-correct, uh, and that international trade more broadly is something that we can't trust the market to self-correct. Now, as an empirical matter, the market is not self-correcting it. We have a $600 plus billion dollar trade deficit, and it's growing. It grew 10% over last year and another 10% over the year before that. So the real question is whether or not we should care. And to answer that question, I think we should step back and, and say, what do we mean by trade? Because ultimately, it gets very abstract with flows of dollars and goods and services and, and assets back and forth. But let's recognize that not all trade is created equal. So, so one form of trade we might envision is that we make $50 billion of airplanes and send it to countries overseas in return for which they make $50 billion worth of cars and send them to us. I think most people, myself included, would say that that sounds like pretty good trade and would clearly be welfare enhancing trade. Now let's say the trade is 50 billion of cars from the rest of the world for 50 billion dollars of M&A advisory services from us. That's probably still a, a pretty okay trade. We'd have to think about that a little bit more, but uh, if our investment bankers are getting an extra 50 billion dollars, they could presumably spend that on all sorts of things and we'd, we'd create a lot of other good jobs. Well, let's say it's $50 billion of cars from the rest of the world in return for $50 billion of our assets. So we're going to give, uh, we're going to send some of our real estate, maybe equity in some of our best corporations, uh, and that's what we're going to exchange. I, I think we'd start to become a little bit more concerned, uh, in part because we're not actually supporting any employment with the sale of assets and corporations, and because, in fact, to the contrary, we're slowly doing the equivalent of, of selling off our body parts in return for immediate consumption. And then lastly, what if we actually just get $50 billion in cars from the rest of the world, in return, we send out pieces of paper that say, I owe you $50 billion. Now, that's what we've actually been doing. Okay, when, when we trade, it's important to remember that the currencies keep track of the trade, but the currency isn't what we trade. We send something in return for everything we get. And if we have a $600 billion deficit in goods and services, we had to send something worth that much to the rest of the world. And what we have sent back, by and large, are pieces of paper called US Treasuries that say the people of the United States promise to pay you with interest someday for this stuff. Uh, and an awful lot of corporate debt that says our corporations of the United States promise to pay you someday with interest for this stuff. And if that's the exchange we have, I think we have some very serious reasons for concern. One reason for concern is if we look beyond consumer welfare. If the question is how many flat screen TVs can we have this year, then it's actually still a pretty great deal because people just sent us a lot of flat screen TVs and we didn't even have to send them anything back. We just sent them little pieces of paper. That's, that's, a, that's incredible trade. Uh, but if we care more holistically about how well we're doing, if we care about welfare of workers, the opportunities that they have, uh, then it's actually a real problem if we let other people produce the stuff that we're going to consume and we don't actually in return produce anything for anybody else to consume. It's also a real problem, I think, for the long-term economic health of the country. Uh, for one thing, other countries are behaving strategically and attempting to gain an upper hand in industries that are likely to be most valuable on important metrics, uh, things where there's likely to be the most productivity growth, where there's likely to be most gain in demand over time. And so those are the ones where we will lose the most ground. In fact, notwithstanding everything you've learned about comparative advantage, the US runs a very large deficit in advanced technology products. I think that's hard to square with how we would expect trade to work. 
Uh, it's a problem long-term for growth and productivity gains in this country if we're selling off our assets and signing over IOUs every year instead of actually doing trade that builds our productive capacity as well. It's a problem if we send our supply chains overseas. One thing that I think is extraordinarily irritating is that after 30 years of being told it doesn't matter what gets made where, so don't worry if we make all the electronics elsewhere, then when someone says, well, why can't we make electronics here? The response is, well, obviously, if all the, if all the expertise in supply chains are embedded overseas, you're never going to make it here. And you just kind of want to slam your face into the table at that point. Uh, but, but that's the point that we've reached. So it seems to me that trade is good, but that we have a, a very strong preference for balanced trade. We have a preference for trade of stuff that we make for stuff that other people makes, which produces the benefits that we want from trade, but also ensures that we're doing trade in a way that maintains our domestic capacity and respects the needs of our workers. And the final question that I'm sure we'll continue to get more into is, can we do anything about it? Because you could say, well, we should establish a policy to reduce our trade deficit, but no such policy will work, so let's give up. And to that, I would just say, I think we can do better. I don't think we can have a perfect policy, but certainly I think making policy with this in mind would be better than making policy without it in mind. And there are at least three major areas where we could make significant difference. One is we could make America a more attractive place to do business and build and invest things. That would, excuse me, invest in and build things. Second, we could confront bad actors and try to discourage other countries from distorting these trade flows. And third, we could affect to alter the relative balance of the value of our assets as opposed to our goods. If we have a substantive preference for other countries buying our goods over our assets, we can essentially impose what would be called a market access charge, which is a tax on buying our assets and make our goods relatively more attractive to them. So I'm over time, but I have one more Hayek quote that I have to conclude with. In the same essay, he says, should our moral beliefs really prove to be dependent on factual assumptions shown to be incorrect, it would be hardly moral to defend them by refusing to acknowledge facts. And so if it is not true that the self-regulating forces of the market will somehow bring about the required adjustments to new conditions, then it seems to me we need to move beyond Hayek's advice on this question. Thank you. So good, good afternoon or evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today and to all the students. I went and visited uh, Yale today with my daughter and she came out like her, with like stars in her eyes and then she said, well, obviously I have no chance of getting in. And so I said, well, I'm actually gonna talk to a lot of people who got in, so you should try. And I don't think she has any chance, but yeah. I was like, I understand statistics. So I'm gonna be a little challenged because like I have to uh, handle my notes, the microphone and the, and the, and the, um, the PowerPoint, and I'm very technically challenged, so please bear with me. So as we said, the question with uh, today is whether we should have a policy to reduce the trade deficit, and I'm going to be defending the no position. And so as you've heard, I mean, some of the arguments for uh, uh, having a policy, and again, uh, what policy can do it apart from actually a serious depression, I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, what uh, uh, we should have a policy because it, um, it creates distortion and usually it harms workers and uh, especially in manufacturing, which Oren and his writing has had a lot of issues with that issue. And, um, and, and we don't produce thing, things here and it hurts our capacities. Um, so let's look at this question, right? I mean, first, um, I would like to say that there's no doubt that actually um, import competition do create distortions. That is not a doubt, but so does uh, domestic competition. I mean, you better talk to workers who 20 years ago had to face the competition from uh, Netflix and blockbusters, right? In, in travel agencies and in, um, and in, um, uh, uh, sorry, blog, uh, blockbuster, well, blockbuster writers, right? So, but what I wanna show today is like, in spite of these distortions that are real, I mean, they are absolutely real, and sometimes they're really big, um, it doesn't mean that Americans as a whole are worse off. And more importantly, when it comes to manufacturing in general and jobs, actually trade is not the villains that many make it out to be. So let's start. 
Uh, contrary to what you hear, uh, trade deficit have, have not uh, caused uh, a, a reduction in civil employment. As you can see in green is a trade deficit and the line in yellow is US civilian employment. Um, of course, you, you, I mean, we, we hear this all the time, but what this actually tells you is that although distortion from trade uh, import competitions do create distortion and create job losses, right, the economy, especially for manufacturing, the economy actually create eight times more jobs in the service industry. Um, we are also told that uh, trade deficit have not uh, have caused uh, worker pay to stagnate. Well, here again, you can see that is not the case. Um, and yet, we are told all the time that a shift away from manufacturing job to the service sector has meant lower wages for workers. And as you can see, that's uh, not the case. And in fact, David Otter at MIT looked at this question and he showed that most jobs that were created in the last 30 years pay more than most of the manufacturing jobs that were lost. What about the claim that Oren made that we don't make things in America anymore? Well, this is wrong. This is adjusted for inflation. U.S. manufacturing output is now near an all-time high. Uh, industrial policy, uh, ca capacity that Oren also is concerned about is at an all-time high. Well, what about the net worth of corp corporations? I mean, these, this is not Wall Street, right, uh, firms. These are the value of the assets at work in producing goods and non-financial services. Again, it is at an all-time high. But what about the assets? Are we really shipping all our assets just for the sake of cheap consumption? Well, look, this is Household and uh, for household and nonprofit, it is the net worth, and that too is at an all time high. So, how can, can we be so prosperous when the last time we had a trade surplus was in 1975? Well, the answer is simple foreigners sell goods and services to us in order to acquire American dollars. They want these dollars in part because they can buy American exports. And what is left, and, and, and in fact, they have been buying these exports. And so as a result, not surprisingly, as import have exploded quite significantly, so have exports. But the other thing that's important is like all of the dollars that the foreigners have acquired by selling her stuff, when they don't come back to us as export, they come back to us as investment. I want to make this very clear. Every dollar we send abroad in the form of us buying import comes back to us in the form of either exports or investment. All of them. Look, I have a chart here. And, um, and this is actually uh, you know, a chart, unfortunately, that is often misunderstood. So Oren has said, you know, uh, and then I'm going to make it short, that trade deficit means lower demand for American workers to produce. Well, that chart shows that it's not, um, it's not the case. What foreigners don't spend on export, they return as demand for workers and good to build a Toyota factory in Kentucky or a large BMW in South Carolina. They return as demand for stocks and real estate. And of course, they return also as demand for Uncle Sam's debt. And does anyone really doubt that the government is going to spend this money? I don't. So the bottom line is that there are two accounts for keeping tabs on foreign commerce. And looking only at the account on which imports and export are recorded, while ignoring the others, like most people do, is like looking only at the bottom of the Mona Lisa and concluding that this is a painting about a woman's hand. It's not. Now, let's look specifically at 
trade with China. Yeah. And, um, and it is true, there's no doubt, that after China entered the WTO, it created great distortions and, and you know, destroyed uh, a lot of jobs. Uh, in their famous paper uh, uh, called The China Shock, there were several, uh, Otter, Dorn, and Henson found that trade with China between uh, 1999 and 2011 actually destroyed 2.4 million jobs, and 1 million of those were in manufacturing. Now, uh, this is correct, but we need to keep things in perspective. You know, for all the talk of all the jobs destroyed um, by China, that 2.4 million jobs over 12 years, that is 1% of the unemployment claims over that period. It's 1%. Um, now, it's also worth saying that there are many studies that have actually looked at the net job effect during that period of the China shock. So basically, not just the destruction in local market, it's important to look at these, but the net effect, and they found a net effect of zero. But it is also true that what is new and what the China shock has revealed is actually that some of the people who've actually lost their jobs, right, they actually did not get jobs uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the other end. So is that a case for protecting manufacturing workers against, um, against um, huh, interesting, here, look at this, and against uh, the trade deficit? And the answer is no, and I, 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 will, I will stop this. And this is like, look, find the China shop on this chart. But actually, for that matter, find NAFTA. Find, find anything that has to do with the trade deficit. And that is because manufacturing decline as a share of employment has actually been happening for almost seven decades. And in fact, the China shock loss, that one million, over that period, it was only 20 million. And the reason, you, but you know what is actually a true job killer in manufacturing? Actually, it is technology. Technology is responsible for over 80% of the job destruction in manufacturing. That's a big deal. It's a good thing because that means more productive jobs and, and uh, higher pay for the people who actually are still employed in manufacturing, right? But that is your true culprit if you want to look at one. So, I'm going to end it there, and, and, um, and that's it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hey, Oren, you have three minutes to respond, and Veronique, three minutes to respond. Yeah. All right. Well, I will, I will try to hit three points in my three minutes. Um, the first is on this question of investment. I think it sounds terrific when we hear that if they're not buying our goods, they're investing instead. Uh, it's important to understand that the phrase investment here includes buying our debt. So buying U.S. Treasury debt, us sending them an IOU, counts as investment. In fact, the vast majority of the flip side of our trade deficit is not what we would think of as productive investment in, in new business activity here. It's just loaning us money. Okay, it's, and, and flipping around, it's us sending IOUs. It's us saying we are giving you nothing for what you're sending us, but we'll pay you more later. Even the share that is FDI, foreign direct investment, that we're supposed to be excited about is overwhelmingly acquisitions, just foreigners taking ownership of things already here. In fact, on, on the scale of the $600 billion trade deficit each year, uh, newest FDI for new establishments in the US is only five to 15 billion, and expansions of existing establishments is two to five billion. So we're talking about less than $20 billion a year of actual investment in productive capacity in this country, 10 times more than that just buying corporate equities, and then five times more than that just loaning us money. That's what we're counting as investment in America. Second point is about manufacturing. Um, I think it was telling that as we went through the slides on everything being wonderful in this country, 
manufacturing actually kind of stagnated. It's not even at an all-time high, uh, and it hasn't really grown in decades. Um, that's deeply concerning, and it's also especially important to think about this claim that it's actually automation and technology that has been the effect, because there are two things that dictate uh, the health of the manufacturing sector and, and employment and wages within it. One is output growth, how much stuff do we make? And two is productivity growth, how much more can each person make? In fact, productivity growth in manufacturing has been incredibly stable over time. During the golden age in the 40s to the 70s, it was 3.4% per year. 70s to 2000, it was 3.1%. 2000 to 2018, it was 3.1%. So we're not automating more quickly than we used to. In fact, we are finding new ways to do more with fewer people at pretty much a constant rate. Now, how is it that we added 5 million manufacturing jobs in one of those periods and lost 5 million in the other? Well, it's because in the earlier period, output was growing at 4.2% a year. As people became able to make more stuff, firms responded by saying, great, let's use them to make more stuff and make even more stuff than that, so we have to hire more people. In the current era, we haven't suddenly started destroying jobs with more automation. We've stopped making more stuff. We've said, well, that's great. Let's just make the same stuff with fewer people. And then, in fact, let's even start to make a little bit less stuff. That's what's changed. Now, our, our thirst for stuff hasn't changed. I wonder what could be the difference in our domestic manufacturing output not growing anymore starting in 2000. Could it be that we now import hundreds and hundreds of billions of more dollars worth of stuff from other places than we make here? That's what's changed. And that's a huge driver of what's gone on in the economy, and particularly the blue collar economy, which is a small segment overall, but is crucial to the health of local economies, is crucially integrated in much broader supply chains, and is by far the industry in which particularly less educated men can earn good, stable livings. So do we have lots of upward lines in the economy? Sure. Yes, there are more jobs now than there used to be though we would have to look at the quality of those. Have wages grown? Yes, though not very much in the last 20 years, and certainly not as fast as they used to. And so the question isn't, has a trade deficit destroyed America? The question is, could we be doing better if we addressed the trade deficit? And I don't think those charts are, can possibly say no to that, and I frankly don't think anything Vero said suggested that actually a trade deficit is good, or even countered the idea, in fact, that there are real reasons to be worried about it. And so if there are real reasons to be worried about it, if we could be doing better, then that is something I think policymakers need to consider. So um, there's a lot to argue there. So I, again, I'd like to uh, like actually just go, I have, I have a chart actually that happens to, and you can look for yourself of what, what it is actually those guys are importing, and it's not really actually a ton of uh, a debt, but, um, but that said, you know, um, assuming that the trade deficit is bad, right, is actually assuming that it has a lot of impact on everything we've talked about. And when Oren talks about manufacturing stagnating, it's actually not output stagnating, not even output in real terms or in nominal terms, it's actually as a share of GDP in real terms. Because as a share of GDP is gone, going down, it's only when you inflate it, when you uh, when you ingest it for inflation that is stable. And that, you know, that's that's fine with me. But that actually also then tells you that um, you know it maybe hasn't been as bad as Oren says. There is absolutely no doubt. The economic literature is absolutely categorical about the fact that changing. Labor saving innovation is actually what makes manufacturing jobs today actually highly productive with higher pay. This is why there are actually uh, people point at them that say, oh, this is a great sector. But the reason why it's a great sector is actually because it has gone through all of these transformation thanks to increase in productivity, which were highly disruptive. Right? But the highly disruptiveness of that effect doesn't mean that as a whole, the economy is not thriving and workers haven't found jobs. It is worth noting two thirds of blue collar jobs are already hired in the service economy. 
So they're not like waiting around looking for a factory. They're actually working in the service economy and they have transitioned. Then I want to address the final point because this is something that Oren says a lot, a lot, a lot. This difference between the growth in output and the growth in productivity. And these two things, there's no reason why they would go together. It's only an, you know, somewhat of an aberration that they actually happened to go right after the Second World War together. One, the output growth is a demand side effect. The increase in productivity, it's a supply side effect. So they don't have reason. The reason why after the war they went up like this, the two, is because we were coming out of a war, devastating war. We were leaving, we were leaving the uh, rationing economy where the manufacturing was directed at actually making weapons. And then, of course, it went up. And by the way, Europe was devastated. So our industries, they were making stuff for people and for the rest of the world. And so there were tremendous productivity growth. And it was great. Sure, it was awesome. There's no doubt. But I would rather not recreate the condition to get this. And by the way, again, there's no reason for those two things to get together. And today, what has happened, again, the difference, first, Oren does agree that product, uh, you know, uh, output growth is still positive. But also, what is happening here is actually a really good thing, right? In manufacturing, on if, when productivity grows, unless the demand grows, the, the prices go down. And what consumers are doing, if they're not asking for more stuff, which rich countries don't do, they actually put the different price in their pocket and they buy services. They go on vacation, they buy Netflix, they go to the movie, and they do things like it. So if you wanted to change that dynamic, and by the way, two thirds of the share of American consumers is spent on services, not goods. And that has been, the, it's been a majority of us spending on services since the 60s. So if Oren really actually wants to change and have serious increase in output uh, growth, there is going to have to convince all of us that we need to stop going on vacation and instead we need to buy more cars, more tables, more lots of things. And good luck with that. <clears throat> okay. Um, I have, as I'll take the moderator's uh, prerogative and ask each panelist one quick question. Um, a number of years ago at the Hoover Institution where I work now, um, Michael Boskin, who was former chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisors, convened an academic seminar on the 20th anniversary of NAFTA. And the proceedings were published, looking through it, came across this one uh, interesting observation. I want to pose a question to Oren, and feel free to weigh in on this too, Veronique. Um, Lorenzo Caliendo, an assist, assistant professor of economics here at Yale, uh, drew a distinction between three types of imported goods, final, intermediate, and raw. And he made the argument that if trade is to have a positive beneficial effect, <clears throat> most of the trade flow has to be in the intermediate category, I guess because of the spin-offs that would occur once those goods are in the, in the states. Would you change your views about trade deficits if the flow was such that it was going, the things coming in were to lead to those kinds of enhancements that uh, happen once an intermediate good reaches our shores? Would you suddenly think those deficits are okay? I think it's a, it's a very good point that, that the composition of, of the trade flow matters and that if what's coming into the country is supplying to domestic producers, then that has a very different um, dynamic than if it's just entering the consumer market directly. I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to think through is the question of if it would even be plausible to maintain a deficit on this scale if what you were supplying is intermediate goods. And I, need to, I, I think it would be hard, but hypothetically you probably could. Uh, and so to the extent that you had the same deficit at the end of the day and it was intermediate goods, I think I would still be very concerned. 
Because I think the, what, the position you would end up in is actually you would look a lot more like what China does, where, and, and you may have noticed I haven't said the word China yet until now, because this isn't about China. China mm -hmm. has its own problems, one of which is most of the value comes into it from Korea and Germany and Japan and other places, and it's mostly an assembler, and then it sends the final good on to us. So if we were to become the assembler in, in the value chain, um, I think you are still missing an awful lot of the high value add components, the best jobs, the areas that are gonna have the most growth, um, and, and the health of the supply chain. And, and so that's why I think looking at the, the absolute deficit really gives you a better picture. Again, if you have lots and lots of stuff coming in, that, that's great if you have lots and lots of stuff going out too. It's if you don't have the lots and lots of stuff going out too that you run into the problem. Well, if I can weigh on this, so, I mean, again, I mean, we have lots of stuff coming in, and we also have lots of capital coming in, and that is, and it's exactly equal. I mean, the trade deficit is exactly the same amount of the U.S. Uh, capital account surplus. We have a trade deficit and a capital account surplus. But I like your question about intermediary good because it actually shows how this debate is actually mostly about things that, categories that are artificial. They're completely artificial. A vast majority of what we import are intermediary goods. So they're for consumption, but they're for consumption of producers manufacturers in America, right? So they're consuming, they're producing. And these many, many, many of these producers, because of the cheap inputs that lower their costs, they're more competitive, and that's why they can export even more than they were. So a lot of where these categories of like consumption versus you know production, uh, import versus export, they're basically the product of the fact that we have to account for them one way or another, but they actually don't give you a really good image of what's happening. And, and you know, there are actually a lot of things that are actually created from even final consumption. The, and it helps, you know, we're all concerned about lower income Americans and final goods, I don't know why we poo poo final good imports because that is what allows lower income Americans to make their dollars go further and that is not nothing. Okay, and then the second question for Veronique is, it's of a China question, sorry, but um, about two thirds of the trade deficit, 419 billion is with China and yet we have obviously a lot of back and forth, a lot of jobs related to that, that those transfers. Yet, um, policymakers, <clears throat> pretty much across the political spectrum, are very, very concerned about China, and that concern has been mounting and growing in recent years, and shows no sign of abating. As a as a libertarian-oriented um, economist, how would you think through the relationship with such a large trading partner if the trading partner's actions are concerning people, and and how would you distinguish? between the kinds of actions that in the past have maybe triggered a response, which we were talking about earlier, versus those that we're facing today with China on things like inserting chips and in products that could be created in Orwellian you know, surveillance state, that kind of thing. So, um, that, that means it's a good question that I can't necessarily answer well because I'm an economist and questions of national security and, and all sorts of things is just obviously, I. I think I have limited things to say, but I can, I can try. So I am absolutely not concerned about trading with China on goods. And again, the reason is because actually they do make our lives better. They send us input, they send us final goods that are make you know, things cheaper here for producers and for consumers. And, and the money that we give them, so, sometimes they use them to buy other stuff with to, from the Japanese and the Japanese invest them here or the Chinese invite, invest them in, in, uh, in, in our debt. And by the way, I mean, I mean the, them investing our debt is not creating the debt. What's creating the debt, because I'm, I'm as big a deficit hawk as they come, and it's the government that spends too much money. It's not because there are people who are willing to buy our bonds. 
It's because actually we need to sell them because we overspend, right? And so uh, I'm not concerned about that, but they are national security issues. They absolutely are national security issues. And I will concede that they are actually, um, I, I am sure if, if, if someone could make the case to me, but they don't have to make it to me. I'm concerned about economic issues. So I'm willing to say, but I would be willing to say that uh, an actually proven case of really national security issue, just usually I would prefer they use national security means, but if actually using uh, protectionism to go for it, yeah, maybe there is a case. Unfortunately, what we've seen recently of like waiving the national security uh, a standard like to to impose tariffs if that if nothing to do with national security it's just cronyism pure and simple and so um, and and but there are people that I absolutely respect if if you know if they are issues with China and they are real issues with China then we should deal with them and it is possible that in the past governments have not done, of all countries, not done enough. One thing is sure, is like President Trump alienated some people who could have helped them, European allies, because everyone feels the same as he feels about China. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, now we're gonna turn to the audience for questions, and maybe if we could have the, the first question go to a student, if possible, if, does any student have a question? And if not, we'll go to a, a more seasoned adult, in the, the gentleman back there. Well, it's just an, you know, an inference here. We'll, we'll talk later. <laughs> I guess this is on. Can you hear? Yeah, you can hear. Uh, I run a heavy manufacturing firm, an aluminum, no less, uh, right here in North Haven. Uh, we manufacture our own equipment. We manufacture, we, we actually build our own equipment. We build our own systems, and we have them programmed. We design them, program them. We're very efficient. Um, I think we've we're getting out more product with fewer people than we ever have before, and yet we're not competitive. So you ask yourself, well, why, are, why aren't we competitive? Well, and I'm going to address this, if I may, to Veronique. Um, we're not competitive because of currency manipulation that we perceive, and of course subsidies, and all this has been well documented, of course, with China. And, uh, it, but the productivity increase has not made the difference for us. I mean, we, we can't be competitive anyway. One of the issues that you didn't talk about was non-reciprocal tariffs. So everybody talks about, about the uh, other subsidies, but non-reciprocal tariffs, I'll give you one example. So in the aluminum market, when we sell something to Europe, COIL, we pay 7.5% of the CIF value, cargo insurance and freight. When they sell COIL to the United States, they pay 3% of the customs value. They don't pay the 3% the on the cargo insurance and freight. When the United States placed a 10% uh, section 232 tariff of 10% on aluminum coil coming in from Europe, there was a retaliatory tariff of 25%. So today, if we ship to, if, if they ship here, they pay 13%, 10, the 10, 232 plus the 3% on the uh, customs value. When we ship there, it's 32.5%. So a lot of this is about not having fair trade. It's not really just productivity. Productivity has made us competitive in the, in the world of comparative advantage, but not in the world of actual trade, which brings to mind the Yogi Berra quote that in theory, theory and practice are the same, but in practice they're not. So my question <laughs> to you is, so my question to you, uh, Veronique, is if other people have concerted efforts and uh, to create a policy of manipulating currencies, of creating uh, trade barriers that are non-tariff trade barriers, excise taxes, steering their production downstream to take more jobs in the supply chain, shouldn't the United States also have a concerted policy as well, which is the topic, of okay. course, Thank you. of this debate. Thank you. I thank you for this question because it allows me to fulfill my, pre my promise to Oren, which I had to cut because of lack of time. So I told Oren that I would actually defend my position of unilateral free trade and my belief that actually the true economic benefits um, comes from uh, unilateral free trade, which pretty much means basically you're always better off economically when you lower your tariffs independently of what other countries are doing. And that is because when 
other countries try to ship their stuff here, they ship it for the benefit of American consumers. And when we put tariff on them, sure, we bother their exporters, but mostly the cost is shouldered by American consumers. And a lot of them, they're producers, as I've said. And then you get into the debacle where then you have tariffs to counter tariffs and retaliation, and you have the system that we have now where basically no one has lowered their tariff. We all face higher tariffs. So actually, the, the answer is really no. I understand that as an exporter, you would rather have uh, free trade. That, that I, I would, you would rather that um, the Europeans lower their tariffs on, on your product coming in. But the truth of the matter, and the economic literature, by the way, there are three now excellent academic paper that have actually looked at the impact, who is shouldering the impact of the tariffs that President Trump has imposed in the last year and a half. And it is consumer in the country that imposes the tariff. And so yes, it is not pleasant, but the net economic cost is, 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 is clearly shouldered by the consumers, consumers who can be producers. So this is why I think it doesn't mean that I don't think we shouldn't make a ton of efforts to work through multilateral <clears throat> trade agreements to lower these tariffs. And, and, you know, and, and we have done a ton of that in the last 50 years. But one of the beauty of our system is not reciprocal tariff. It's actually that you treat every single country the same way. So basically, you can have a 10% tariff like we, like, or like you can have a 25% tariffs like we do on light trucks, because it's always the others who put high tariffs. Not true. We do that too. And, but you do it, and you, 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 you do it, and you screw your consumers who want to consume light trucks wherever they come from. That's what effectively it means. And the beauty of this is you cannot discriminate against other countries. And, and it means basically more peace. And it has actually worked. It is not perfect. Nothing is perfect when politics is involved. Warren, you want to uh, say something? Yeah, I guess two quick notes that I was just jotting down. One is I think it's really important to emphasize that this analysis about how Americans are better off, all the studies say X, on and on and on. Um, is all done from the perspective of a, of a point-in-time consumer welfare standard. It is true that if we get rid of all of our tariffs, if we say, hey, countries that want to massively subsidize their own producers and dump stuff into our country, uh, yes, things are cheaper on day one in America. That's, that, it, would be in, incredibly, it would be incredible if that weren't the case. Um, but that's a really, really blinkered way to think about economic policy and to think about what we're trying to accomplish. And, and the analogy I would offer is to patents. Okay, a patent is an intervention in the free market to restrict free exchange in a way that drives up prices for consumers. If we got rid of all patents tomorrow, lots of things would immediately be cheaper. You, you hear this in the, in the drug pricing argument, right? Why, well, why don't we just get those Canadian drugs? And, in a lot of times, especially libertarians, will make the very good point that that is not a sufficient analysis of the situation. And so the fact that we use patents doesn't per se prove that a given trade intervention is good, but I think it's really important to look through that lens and recognize that good economic policy is not a matter of what is cheapest today. It is a matter of what is going to produce a healthy and prosperous market in the long term. And then the second point I want to make is that you know, the, the tariff point is a little bit limited because it talks specifically about what we do on products coming to our market. But more broadly, when we think about the behaviors of other countries, it's really important to emphasize the extent to which free trade and free markets are not companions, that they are directly in conflict, and that we almost have to choose between them. And that the more aggressively we embrace free trade, regardless of what other countries are doing, the more aggressively we introduce extraordinarily non-market forces and distortions into our own market. And so we can say we are so passionate about the principle of free trade that we don't care that our labor market is now to a significant extent dictated to by Chinese communist policy, 
But I would argue that we should strike the balance differently and actually be willing to be more skeptical of free trade if it means we preserve something that more closely approximates the conditions of a free market within our own borders. Can I just say one, one thing? So I actually think the analogy between tariffs and patent is actually a terrible one <laughs> because patents are too about respecting uh, property rights uh, or at least trying to, uh, as, as best as, as we can, and they are debates over whether it should be longer, or shorter, what's the right time. But tariffs, the only way to think about tariffs is the government decided that two people want to trade in different countries. They're going to interfere and say, if you buy your goods there, we're going to make you, American consumer, pay a higher price. It has nothing to do with property rights. In fact, it interferes with property rights. So I think it's, a, it's not a good analogy. Okay, well, well, sorry, I now I have to say one more. The, the patent issue is really interesting, so I think it's worth, I, I don't mean to be all postmodern, but, but the patent as a property right is purely a legal construction of our system. We could just as easily declare the aluminum manufacturer to have a property right uh, in his quota of a certain sale within this country. I think it is wise that we have designated patents a property right, but those things that we choose under our legal system to make property rights as part of a functioning free market are, in fact, interventions to prevent free exchange in certain situations. Okay, we have, we'll have time for another question, but I want to remind the panelists that the uh, only thing standing between this audience and that bar outside is this panel. Oh. <laughs> Let's go drink. <laughs> is there a student with a question, by any chance? If not, oh, do we have one there? Okay, go ahead. Hi, it was, uh, it was argued that 90, 90 to 95% of foreign direct investment goes to purchasing equity in existing real assets and very little goes to funding new initiatives. Um, but does the purchase of existing equity not give domestic investors more liquid assets to invest in new initiatives themselves? Yeah, I assume that's for me. Yes, so the if, if what you have, and, and again, I think this is why it's so helpful to step back and actually think about what is the actual exchange that ends up taking place at the end of the day. So it sounds great to envision that these American dollars are coming in for U.S. whoever receives them to spend on something. But we have to remember that that, that American dollar is probably only exists in a computer and only exists because first it left to acquire the good. And so the easiest way to think about what is actually happening in the economy is to just take all the electronic dollar values going back and forth out and think about what has actually changed in the real world. And if what has changed in the real world is that Japan has sent us a car and we have sent them equity um, in Facebook, then there isn't anyone in America who actually has more money to invest. Now, what's actually happened if we try to start following the money further is there's someone in America who has a car now, and they probably had to spend money on that car, so who, who'd they sell the car? We can start tracing it all the way through. But as compared to a situation where um, somebody bought the car from an American producer, there's certainly no, there's no additional new amount of investment created in the world that we now get to spend. What has actually happened, what's actually moved in the world is things from elsewhere came here and we sent, we signed something back saying you now control something that we used to. I actually think it's a completely um, irrelevant distinction actually because yeah, we send our dollars and we get stuff in exchange and some of that dollar comes back when we send things but to say that the fact that these investments come back here and that it's, or, or even through a computer and they never leave or whatever, and that they don't lead to actually the demand for American products makes no sense. Look at all the foreign auto factories. This is built here. It's a demand, an actual demand that did not exist 
if these guys didn't have those American dollars. And they're, they're building the plants. I mean, BMW has the largest plant outside of Germany. It's in an, outside of Greenville, South Carolina. It is not just like actually had to build the company, but it had to staff it. It's had, and, and it's created, have you been to Greenville? I mean, it's a rural community that's well on its way of being a, the, one of the most pleasant, uh, you know, like mid-city. So, I mean, like, it's same thing for Toyota factories in manufacturing. And by the way, all these cars that these companies are, are building here, what do they do with them? Well, Toyota, for one, it's their biggest base for exports, right? So we, they send their dollars Back, they bring these dollars back, they invest, they big plants, they reinvest on R&D and things like this, they build more cars, and this is, the, the, the car market is the export market, and that's what they do. So they, I, I just don't see, and even when Chinese buy our debt, you know, that money is actually used by the government. And, and so I, I just, I, I think it's a distinction that may sound good just because it's like, good and, and, and dollars, but the truth of the matter is like, they actually increase demand, ultimately at the end, demand for American goods and services. And, and this is actually, it's great. It is great. Okay, on that note, I want you to join me with a warm round of applause for our two panelists.